folks. Thank you for being here. It's lovely to be here for the second time. Um, so I want to talk to you about a problem that's very near and dear to my heart, and that's the problem with complex systems. And I argue that this is a problem that is all of our responsibility, that we are building systems that are designed to do so many more wonderful things, but we need to build them to have more complexity to do those wonderful things, and we keep on making these systems that are harder and harder to run. And I think that it's our job to make sure that they don't become too hard to run, right? That they're maintainable, that they're scalable. And these are problems that we have to care about that we can't outsource onto some other team. This is really kind of our moment to think about what are we doing to make our systems actually something we can maintain and scale over time. And I think compounding that, we have systems now where there's no definition of this is 100% up. Any of you remember, like, you had one web server who was either, either up or down? Yeah? How many of you, you had web servers like that once upon a time? OK, right? Like, not very many of us have that situation now. So we have to have more complex strategies for thinking about taming that complexity. And we have to think about what are we going to do differently? How are we going to have our software operations run in a way that's not out of the 1990s, right? We're not, we're not carrying around floppy disks anymore. So that's the challenge I want us to think about today, is how do we evolve our strategies for dealing with and managing complexity? So I customize this for every city that I give this talk in. Um, so we're in my hometown of New York, so New York Pizza Co. bought DevOps, right? They said, we're going to solve this problem by throwing money at some vendors. Maybe our vendors will be able to solve this problem for us. And fortunately, this didn't have the effect that they were hoping for. Because it turns out when you order the alphabet soup without actually knowing what you want, that kind of creates even worse problems than you started with. Right? You say, OK, let's just, what's a Kubernetes? I guess I want one. Give me a Kubernetes. That, that's going to solve my problems, right? Or why don't we add some continuous integration and continuous deployment so we can ship more shit faster, right? Let's ship the shit as quickly as we can. Or what about having infrastructure as code, right? Like, you know, let's, let's go and try to compile all of this infrastructure that we don't understand. Let's just put it into a blob somewhere and check it in. That'll solve our problem. Or what if we use PagerDuty and we put all of our developers on call? That, that's going to make everything immediately solved, right? And fortunately, uh, PizzaCo discovers this is not actually solving their problems. Because when you put engineers on call, it means that they suddenly don't have the skills necessarily to deal with the on-call problems because you haven't trained them to do that. You haven't prepared them, right? You've just said, here's your pager. Congratulations, right? And now people are grumpy all the time because they keep on getting paged in the middle of the night. They can't get enough sleep. And it turns out that our job as engineers and as engineering managers is a creative job. We have to have kind of the creative capacity that comes from getting good nights of sleep. And people just shut off the alerts at the end of the day. That's no good. And guess what? You bought these wonderful, wonderful dashboards right? that your vendor sold you and said, well, automatically create dashboards for all of your services. How many of you actually look at those dashboards? How many of you actually find them useful? Or what about the dashboards that your engineers created after your 10 most recent incidents? Are you looking at all of the graphs from the 10 most recent incidents? People wind up being lost and confused in data. And data becomes almost like a, you write once and you read it never. So that's not good. And in the meanwhile, you did this because you're trying to make your software practice modern, right? But your customers are getting really, really grumpy because your incidents take forever to fix because you haven't actually solved any of the problems that were causing high incident rates and high rate, uh, amounts of time to fix things. And you might have one person on your team who knows how to do ops, but that doesn't really scale, right? Like, people line up talking to that one expert. How many of you are that one expert on your team? Everyone's lined up your, out, out your door. Yeah, I see a few hands in the audience. It, come on, let's be honest. Like, a lot, a lot of you here are tech leads for a reason, right? Like, it's because you're the expert. But we have to think about how we scale out that skill, right? Because otherwise, eventually, one day you're going to go on vacation. Something's going to break. That's not going to be a happy time for your team. And guess what? You bought all this lovely, wonderful, continuous deployment infrastructure. It makes sure each individual box is green. It doesn't check the connections between the boxes. 
It might be a problem walking around with a broken leg. So you have to think about how do we look at the system as a whole? How do we make sure that we have the system in a deployable state, not just because each of the boxes individually is green? Your staging environment is not going to detect all of your problems for you. So you put the team on call. They're burnt out. They're tired. They feel they don't have time to do projects to solve this because everything is on fire so much. The team is in a state of operational overload. And even if they do find like a few hours to work on it, what's the plan? How are we getting out of this? Right? If you don't know how to work with production and how to make it better, you're going to have a devil of a time getting yourself out of there. You're lost in the woods without a map, and you're just basically holding on by, you know, by, the, by your fingers. Right? Like, that's not really a fun situation for a team to be in. So where did this all go wrong? I think where we went wrong is that we forgot who runs systems. It's the people who run systems and have to manage and tame the complexity. And no amount of tooling can help us here, because tools can help us automate something that we know how to do, but tools can't help us plan on our own. We have to develop that roadmap. And that involves thinking about our people, culture, and process. So this is what I call the art of production excellence, is thinking about how do we build sustainable systems, systems that are appropriately reliable, that they're scalable, and that they don't burn the humans out. We have to make our systems more reliable and friendly and not feed the computers with our blood, sweat, and tears. You have to plan, right? If we think about doing planning for our feature development, where is our roadmap for production excellence? Right? How are we thinking about how we get from point A to point B? How do we think about how to get to a state where people are happy to be on call, where people are happy with the state of production? That does not happen by accident. So that also means that you have to prioritize it alongside all of your feature requests, that you have to think about, in addition to what features are we developing, but what features are we developing for ourselves as the people who operate the system? We have to commit to doing the right long-term thing. And we have to not just involve our own teams. We have to think about related teams, right? Think about operations teams, support teams, customer service, sales. We have to think about all of these teams together in order to be able to tackle this problem effectively. Again, thinking about the idea of safety, right? Of kind of removing ambiguity, making sure that people know it is OK to ask questions. It's OK to learn what you need from other people rather than feeling like, oh my goodness, I can't touch that. If I touch it, I might break and people will yell at me, right? Like, that's not a fun situation to be in. So how do we get started? I think that the core of production excellence is these four things. Do you know when things are too broken? And can you debug them in collaboration with other people when they are broken? And finally, can we eliminate the unnecessary complexity? Can we make the system simple enough over the long term such that we can continue to run them rather than just have them grow and grow and grow in complexity over time? That's it. So how do we do this? Well, I said earlier that our systems are never 100% up, right? We have to accept that some part of our systems are inevitably failing, right? If you have a lawn made up of grass, do you make sure that every single leaf in the lawn is, is green? No, it's OK for some of the leaves in, the, in your lawn to be brown, right? So we have to think about measuring. What does too broken mean? It's a business process. So I call this the idea of service level indicators. It's part of the site reliability engineering practice, thinking about what are our critical business events, right? Maybe it's a user being able to visit your website and check out a shopping cart, for instance, if you're Shopify, right? So think about what are your business critical user facing events and what context do they operate in and be able to figure out is this event good or bad? And doing it in a way that you don't need a human to analyze it, that the computers can tell you whether or not a customer was satisfied. Ballpark. But if you're not sure how to measure this, ask your product managers. They might have a good idea. For instance, they might say, you know what? The threshold that's bucketing these events, if we serve that set of events with HTTP error code 200 and latency less than 300 milliseconds, that's a good user interaction. But if they get served to 500 or it takes longer than 300 milliseconds, that user's unhappy, right? 
And that gives us an idea of, OK, this means that this interaction is good or bad. So after that, we think about, OK, what's the denominator, right? Like, how many total events do I care about? For instance, if I get attacked by a botnet, I'm not going to count those for or against my total of happy users, right? So throw out the events that don't make sense, and then you have your availability number. And you can set a target for that availability number. For instance, I might say, I want to have 99.9% .9 of my events be successful over a 30-day window, where an event is defined as good if it's HTTP 200 in less than 300 milliseconds, right? So if you've defined your SLO well, it means that you have meant that users are just barely happy enough, that they're not running away to your competitor, right? And if they do see an error, it's not the end of the world. They'll refresh, and it'll work as they, as they intend. So what's the beauty of this? The beauty of this is that you can alert using your service level objective, that you can say this target service level objective is what I'm going to run my service to. If my service is on fire, I want to know. But otherwise, just let me sleep through the night. I can look at it the next day. It's fine. So we have to think about the inverse of 99.9%. .9%. If my target availability is 99.9%, .9%, that means that I'm allowed to have one in a 1,000 requests fail. So if I suddenly start having more than one in a 1,000 requests fail, then it means that I will run out of allowed requests at some point in time that I'm allowed to fail. And if I'm going to run out in a matter of hours, you know, yes, please, wake me up. But if I'm not going to run out in a matter of hours, you know what? It can wait for the next business day. That's OK, right? This is how we get rid of false alarms, is that we focus on user outcomes rather than focusing on, oh my goodness, the disk on one server is above 90%. 90%. So we need to think about what are our data-driven business decisions, right? We care about keeping users happy, not about keeping disk on servers below 90%. And we can also think about making decisions about, should I be working more on my feature backlog or on my reliability backlog? Well, are you above or below your target service level objective? If I have plenty of error budget left, I can say, you know what? We're going to do this risky flag flip experiment and see what happens, and we can roll it back if there's a problem. Or if I'm persistently getting paged because I have my service level objective in danger, I can go and invest in reliability improvements. So it's better to have any service level objective that you're measuring compared to not having any service level, level objective at all, because you can't really understand what you're not measuring. So yes, having a perfect SLO is great, but like, start somewhere. Measure what you can today, like, even if it's measuring HTTP 200s from your, uh, from your load balancing service. And you know, maybe one day you'll do real user monitoring, or maybe one day you'll do synthetics, right? But you don't have to do that today. And you can iterate over time and adapt to what you're hearing from your customer success teams. User needs can change. So once you do this, you'll be getting alerts only when your users are in danger of becoming really, really grumpy. But SLIs and SLOs are only half of the picture here, because SLIs and SLOs tell you when things are too broken, but they don't help you actually fix the problems when something is on fire. So our outages are never the same, right? They may look similar, but they're never exactly the same. We can't fix new kinds of outages in the exact same way as old outages, right? And if you're having the same outage over and over and over again, maybe that's a structural problem, right? Like maybe you need to think about how do we prevent repeat outages. But in general, you can't predict exactly how things are going to fail. That it doesn't make sense to kind of focus on tiny little things that you're micro-focusing on and failing to realize, oh, oh goodness, there, there's a big bug right there, right? Like, that's not, a, that's not a good situation to kind of focus on the wrong things. So you can't predict in advance what your failure modes are. So instead, we have to think about how do we debug new kinds of failures in production? You're not going to catch everything in staging. You have to be able to understand what's going on in my data. What is potentially going on that's causing this outage? So we have to think about hypothesis formation, right? About forming hypotheses about what's going on in production, and then verifying, is that actually true? 
because it sucks when you think, oh my goodness, like this is what's gone wrong, and it's not actually the problem. When you fix a problem that doesn't exist, that slows down the time to resolution. So you have to be able to look at your instrumentation data and say, here's a new question that I want to ask, right, to understand what's going on in my system. So all this is to say that our services have to be observable. The definition of observability is our systems produce enough telemetry that they can explain themselves to us and answer new questions that we have without us having to redeploy our code. That they have to be observable from the outside. And in order to do that, we have to be able to understand what's the context of our events, right, that we were talking about earlier with service level objectives. Can we understand how events flow through our system and what properties are associated with them? And can we understand what's the variance, right? If we have one set of users that is experiencing a higher error rate, or maybe it's one machine that's causing a higher error rate, how can you track that down? And how can you potentially even automatically resolve it, for instance, by draining away from a data center or a bad machine, and then looking at the problem later? The best page is one that never goes off because you just wind up having telemetry automatically recorded and then getting to look at it during business hours later. So you need SLOs in order to understand when are things too broken, and you need observability to understand how to fix the problems. But those two things don't create collaboration. You have to think about collaboration as another piece of the puzzle that helps you run systems better. We don't debug alone. It maybe was the case 10 years ago that you could debug and understand your complex system alone. But today it means that we have to work together either with other people on our team or with services and teams that we depend upon or who depend upon us. We have to work together in order to understand this rather than kind of pointing fingers and saying, you know what, it's the vendor's fault. So everyone has to be involved in this. That if you have a customer service team or customer support team, they have to know and feel comfortable escalating issues to you and working with you to understand what's going on with this customer. Everyone winds up contributing to production excellence and benefiting from it. And we have to feel comfortable talking to each other, right? If people don't feel safe to do good work with each other, then it means that we're going to have these barriers to communication that mean our outages take much longer to resolve. The idea of service ownership doesn't mean service selfishness, right? Don't ship your org chart, right? Be willing to collaborate across those boundaries when it really matters. We're trying to make sure that our systems run sustainably but that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone has to be on call all the time, right? There are a variety of different cases, like people often have children and can't necessarily be on call during the middle of the night. People often have religious reasons why they might not be able to do on call during Saturdays, right? That's fine. We have a team for that reason. We can work together to all pitch in in the ways that we individually can contribute. And we have to document things. We have to write down how we understood things to fail in the past, and kind of in the words of Tanya Riley, who's speaking later, um, we kind of have to leave ourselves cookies, not traps for our future selves. That we have to think about writing down the right amount of information so that we have enough documentation to understand how do I get started debugging this without leaving ourselves a bunch of out-of-date documentation. The only thing worse than no documentation is misleading documentation. And stop being that one hero, right? Like, you know, thank you for the honesty, right? Like, sometimes I am that hero, but like, stop being that one hero who is kind of hoarding knowledge, you know, not necessarily on purpose, right? But you have to share your knowledge and write it down so that other people can benefit from your wisdom. And you have to explicitly think about how do we reward curiosity and teamwork? Right? Like, how do you make sure that people feel comfortable asking questions? And one great way of doing that is to actually, you know, thank people for asking questions or thank someone for sharing their knowledge with you. To kind of have a culture of publicly thanking other people for being willing to ask questions and share their knowledge. And that also involves blameless postmortems to, or blameless retrospectives. To be able to understand in an environment that's safe kind of how things went wrong and how we can do things better in the future. 
So we have to learn from the past as well in order to make sure that our services run more sustainably in the future. We have to collaborate almost with our future selves. So why is this important? Well, outages are not necessarily identical, but they frequently rhyme with each other, that you have kind of similar outages that happen in different ways. So we have to think about planning. How do we plan to have our services run better in the future? For instance, if I have a bridge that's falling down, right? Maybe the roadbed is missing. And sure, it needs an earthquake retrofit in 20 years, right? Like, which of these things do I address first? We have to think about kind of prioritizing what we work on. So one way of doing this is thinking about how often is a outage going to happen that you know about, and how bad is it going to be? And then kind of using that to figure out, OK, what's the total magnitude of this risk? Of course, there are risks that you don't know about, but I'm sure any one of us can also name risks that we know about in our systems. And then once you have that, you can kind of multiply that out and think about if you have an outage that is both frequent and severe, that's probably one of your most significant risks that is most in danger of, of causing you to break your customer's trust and break your service level objective. The other interesting pattern I'm going to point out here is that you cannot necessarily fix time between failures, that trying to adjust the frequency of an outage is frequently the least controllable thing. So instead, we need to think about reducing the impact, reducing the blast radius of our failures. So we need to choose and prioritize what we work on and address the risks that are threatening our customers and our service level objective. And fortunately, if you've gathered this data and you say, this is my target reliability, that I want to have no more than one in a thousand events fail, but this risk creates a risk that we're going to have one in 1,500 events fail, right? you can say, huh, that doesn't leave us a lot of room for other kinds of failures. That makes a very strong business case for prioritizing that alongside your other features. But you can't just you know, write these down on a list of you know, things that Liz is going to say, I told you so, ha ha, right? Like you have to actually complete the work. If you don't complete the work and it's sitting on a list of pre-mortems, right, that's not actually going to make your customers happy. So you have to drive these things to completion in order to have a resilient enough system. But I want to wrap this up kind of by talking about systemic risks. I want to talk about the idea that we can quantify specific risks, but I think that we're missing a lot when we do that. That if every outage that you have takes an extra half hour to resolve because people can't find the right dashboards, because people can't drill down into the data, because people can't understand what's going on in production, that is a systemic risk. And that's something that is impacting every single other outage that you have. So we have to think about kind of these meta risks and figure out how do we address them? How do we make it so that engineers have an easier time understanding production in order to decrease the amount of risk that we have in our system? Likewise, if you don't have collaboration on your teams, if your customer success team got yelled at the last time that they reported an outage to the engineer on call, guess what? If they see something weird in production from a customer calling in and they don't report it, and then two hours later you discover that all of your customers are sad, Congratulations, you've introduced a huge systemic risk because people didn't feel safe to collaborate and communicate. So make sure that people feel safe collaborating and communicating. So, you know, yes, buying tools has its place. Buying the alphabet soup sometimes makes sense. But for all that's good for your developers, for your customers, make sure that you season your alphabet soup with production excellence practices. So think about how do we measure whether our systems are too unhappy. Can we debug? Can we understand what's going on in production? Can we work together with each other to solve the issues? And can we implement long-term sustainable fixes rather than just papering over our bugs? So that's all that I have for you. Thank you very much.